Hi, everybody, and welcome to the fifth um, Australian LC Genomics event um, being held in June 2023. My name is Ainsley Newson. I'm Professor of Bioethics at the University of Sydney, and I convene this network. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today, whether you're joining us live or virtually. I would like to start by acknowledging country that we, if we're in Australia and in many other countries globally, we are on unceded Aboriginal land. And for me here in Sydney today, that is the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation. And we are coming together virtually, but we are all bringing together ourselves on Aboriginal land. And I would also like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and the long traditions of knowledge sharing and care for country and knowledge that come through Indigenous knowledge. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge before we start formally that this network has come together with the support of Australian Genomics. And I'd also like to particularly acknowledge Kitty Jean Lagina, who has done an absolutely enormous amount of work behind the scenes for today's event. And today we're going to be talking about the importance of understanding and valuing lived experience, that is the experiences of patients with genetic conditions in their families, but how this experience can also enrich and improve and enhance um, research on ethical, legal and social aspects of genomics. We know that there is a lot of work about patients. There is a lot of ethical, legal and social work about patients. But up until fairly recently, there has been much less work with patients. And as we'll go on to discuss, actually, we almost have, um, from a patient perspective, that the tables have really turned. And that has been extremely welcome, but also it is potentially bringing with it other challenges, which we will get to unpick in this session. Today, we are really privileged to have with us Holly Feller. And Holly is a mother, advocate, and co-founder of both Genetic Cures Australia and Usher Kids Australia. And Usher Kids is, as Holly will go on to tell us a bit about it, um, it's a support network for families of children who are diagnosed with Usher syndrome, which is a rare genetic condition, and she'll tell us a bit about that. Holly also works with Genetic Support Network Victoria, and she's gonna wear a lot of hats in this session today. So um, I also should just say before we start, Holly has a short presentation but we, um, we have a lot of time for discussion. Our sessions are timetabled to go for one and a half hours. And I have some pre-prepared questions, but I'm also extremely happy not to use those after Holly's presentation. If others have questions that they would like to ask and we can pepper them with your questions and my questions. And um, another aspect of the way this network operates, if it's the first time that you've joined us, is at the end of the more formal proceedings and discussion, we. Uh, utilise breakout rooms. And these aren't necessarily to talk about the topic of the day. They are um, completely random. I just divide them up, divide the group up, depending on how many people are around. And the point of this is just to allow us to talk to each other, to get to know each other, to find out who we are and what we do, and make new connections in the LC genomics space in Australia. So you're very welcome to stay on for that bit at the end. We'll see how we go. Um, the other thing I should say is because there's quite a few of us, um, it may be difficult for me in my capacity as chair to keep track of the discussion if people are just using a physical hand signal. So I'd really appreciate if you could use the raise hand function that will help me to keep track. And if I've missed you for whatever reason, feel free to unmute and just let me know or type something in the chat. And I have Kitty here to help me with that as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Holly. And Holly's going to uh, share her screen and tell us a bit about um, her perspective with all of those different things she does and a bit about some of the work that she's been doing with Usher Kids Australia. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you so much as well, Ainsley. I'm very excited to be um, invited to this today. So I'm just going to um, share my screen. Great. So. Um, as um, Ainsley has um, already introduced me, my name is Holly Feller. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Usher Kids Australia, and I also work part-time as a project officer at the Genetic Support Network of Victoria, also known as the GSNV. Um, and I'm also a non-executive director of um, a charity, Genetic Cures Australia, which my husband and I set up some time ago um, for um, research into um, inherited um, retinal diseases. 
So now my slideshow won't work because it was obviously working when uh, when um, we were practicing. Yeah, Holly. Sometimes you just oh, there you go. I was going to yeah. say sometimes you just need to click in the slide yeah, to get right. Zoom to cooperate. Um, so I'm also going to acknowledge the country on which um, I'm sitting and presenting to you here today, the Boonarong people, who are the traditional custodians of this land, which I join in from today, um, and pay my respects to the Boonarong elders past and present and extend this respect to um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait peoples from other communities who are with us today. So um, I've titled um, my slides, There's Always a Silver Lining, because um, one of the things that I really want to um, present today is the fact that um, uh, I'm, I'm not a researcher, uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an educator. Um, I have uh, kind of fallen into this realm um, very happily um, as part of my life. Um, as a mother of a child with a rare disease. So I'm actually um, the mother of three children. I have a 20-year-old who's at university and a 17-year-old um, who's in her second last year of school. And then my third child is Harry, um, who pictured here quite, he's quite young, but actually will turn 12 on Saturday. And he was born with a condition called um, Usher syndrome, um, but we weren't aware of that um, at birth. So um, a little bit about that. Uh, Harry was born um, when there was um, the beginning of um, the newborn screening for hearing loss and um, a hearing loss was picked up at birth from that process when he was born. So um, having had two children with no, um, no issues with their hearing before, it came as a, as a massive shock to my husband and I. Um, and um, I guess because we um, he was going to be our last child and family planning was an issue for us, we didn't really look at, um, at the cause of his hearing loss at that, at that point. Uh, so what we did do, though, was merrily go along with life, um, dealing with the child with a hearing loss. He was, was a recipient of cochlear implants, which are the most amazing um, invention ever. And um, and with regard to hearing, was hitting all these milestones, but he was not hitting his milestones um, in some of his growth, gross motor skill areas and wasn't able to walk, wasn't able to stand, wasn't able to crawl um, at the times when children normally would do that. And we started to think that there was something going on, um, but weren't really sure how or what to do about it until we saw an article in a newspaper about a family who were taking their deaf son on, on a helicopter ride because they were creating a visual memory bank for him because he was also losing his sight. Um, at this point, my husband kind of started to use Google as like many of us do these days, um, and um, investigated the condition of this family and discovered that um, there was a very strong proponent of um, um, this condition in uh, people with Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, which we both had. So we went down the road of um, getting some genetic asking for some genetic testing to confirm whether he did or he didn't have this condition and it may have been the cause of his hearing loss. Um, and that at the time was a very long, difficult process um, because genetic technologies were not where they are today and they were not very accessible. Cost was very, very high and um, it had to be sent to the US um, and it took over six months for us to get a reply. But in the meantime, we had linked up with this family who had um, been part of the um, article and um, that's where I met Emily Shepherd, who is, um, is the other half of Usher Kids. So um, Emily and I, um, when I received the positive diagnosis that Harry indeed did have Usher syndrome, and that was the cause of his hearing loss, but it would also be the cause of a vision loss um, progressively in life due to um, an eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that for you. Uh, but I was very lucky um, because not only did I find another um, mother and family 
with a child pretty close in age to my son, but they live three suburbs away from us, which, you know, was just phenomenal, really, when we think about it. Um, and Emily convinced, Emily and I went across to America to a um, global conference on Usher syndrome, and we came back and Emily um, and I agreed wholeheartedly that we needed to do things a lot better in Australia, that, that it wasn't fair for families to go through what we both went through in terms of having to get a diagnosis, being told there was nothing that could be done about the condition and, um, and not having any, any real support, um, peer-to-peer support um, around that. So that is when we, um, we joined forces and we set up Usher. Kids Australia. So here I'm just um, showing you some an image of one of the articles we did when we when we first um, set the organisation up to um, to just create awareness. That was really our main um, criteria when we when we set it up to build awareness around the condition. Um, and very quickly we moved on to to other areas that we felt were really important. But I think generally when you're looking um, at support groups, so peer, um, patient support groups, um, looking after um, patients and their carers um, with rare diseases, undiagnosed diseases or genetic conditions. Um, they're, they're put together for one of three reasons, mostly um, wanting to support that community, a community with that condition, advocate for um, better quality of life for the patients and their families, and to educate um, the families, but also any um, healthcare workers and clinicians that would be supporting those families as well. Um, so these are some of the main reasons um, that a patient support group would, would be formed um, or how they're formed. I guess um, very often they're formed by uh, a patient or a family member who has had a diagnostic odyssey um, themselves and experienced it and, and is not and felt that it's it's great for anyone else to undergo that um, experience and wants to do better for the community. Um, it can be set up with a just a really strong desire to connect peer to peer. Um, and, and very often you see in support groups, they, they don't materialise a lot further than that. So they just might be a Facebook group that brings families and patients together with that one condition. Then there are those that um, start a patient support group to drive research primarily for, for treatments or a cure um, with innovation. And there's a lot of funding um, prerequisites around those type of support groups. Um, and rarely, but not totally uncommon, um, a support group could be um, started through clinical interest to support families' journeys. So um, I, we have examples of genetic counsellors that have helped families set up support groups um, and running those support groups on their behalf. Um, so Usher Kids Australia, we formed in, in 2016. It was just Emily and I, and we had the mandate, um, now we're not alone, at least there's two of us. Um, and we set up as a not-for-profit charitable organisation. Um, both of our sons um, have Usher syndrome. They have um, different, they have Usher syndrome type one, but formed from different genes. Um, there are 12 genes, and there's probably actually more than that now. They, they, it keeps, they keep finding more. Um, there were around 12 genes that can cause Usher syndrome. Um, and it is an autosomal recessive condition. So um, it, it, it comes as a surprise to most um, families when, when they have a child diagnosed with it. Um, in my earlier conversation, I, I mentioned that we started it after experiencing a lack of support post-diagnosis. Um, we can both tell stories of clinicians that um, told us before we got our diagnosis that it was very unlikely that that would be the cause of the condition because of because the prevalence levels were and the awareness were quite low um, and I think it's that's no longer the case 
um, I think we've been very successful in, in creating a lot more awareness around the condition in Australia. And now we have 60 families, um, which is approximately 70 children, because some families have more than one child, um, and over 500 professionals linking into our organisation. So we, um, we're really proud of what we've been able to achieve with our work. Um, for those who are interested in the genetics, Usher syndrome um, is a rare autosomal um, recessive condition and affects around one, to one out of 6,000 individuals. Um, different types um, have uh, more uh, prevalence than others. Um, their clinical features are um, from profound deafness to, to variable hearing losses, um, deteriorating vision loss, which is caused by um, retinitis pigmentosa, and in type one, which um, uh, is the type that my son has, it, there is also a vestibular dysfunction. And when I mentioned um, earlier that when we were kind of trying to understand what, what was happening with him when he was a toddler, we were very often told that the vestibular dysfunction, like the symptoms around that were caused by his deafness, where in fact it is actually part um, of um, the clinical diagnosis of um, Usher syndrome type one. So the age of diagnosis varies. Um, uh, they, there are um, more and more genes being discovered every day, and with that, um, they now uh, there are now some types which um, have non-syndromic um, uh, symptoms. Um, so, for example, they may have a hear, um, no hearing loss, but they have vision loss, but but um, that's picked up genetically um, in. Um, to show that it is Usher syndrome. And there, we say there is no cure, but, um, and the treatment involves managing symptoms, but um, all the work that goes into to looking for treatments um, at the moment is based on the eye condition because um, the hearing aids and cochlear implants are enabling um, people with Usher syndrome to communicate very effectively. Um, and um, so I think that, part has kind of been left um, for the moment and the focus is really on on the on the vision loss. So um, our vision at um, Usher Kids Australia is to empower the Usher community through support and connection and knowledge and our purpose is to see children and their families living with Usher syndrome love their lives um, and I think if you look at most support groups, P2P support groups that are out there, um, words very similar in meaning to support connection and knowledge will feature in their mission statements and their vision sta statements. And I think, um, you know, that's a really impactful thing to remember um, about what they're all trying to do. Our short-term goal um, in our organisation is to create a community of peer support amongst the parents, which we hope reduces the um, you know, the deterioration of mental health um, and, and their well-being um, because there are disparities in families living with children with rare diseases um, and, and there are papers um, around that, um, that, that that show that that is um, actually the case. And in the long term, we want to improve the capacity of, um, of, other, of the children in Australia living with Usher syndrome um, so they can advocate for themselves and ensure that they've got the skills and the knowledge to engage in education and in employment and community activities and reduce the lifetime burden on the government supports. Uh, so in terms of diagnosis, um, I think, again, um, this is very probably true of many um, genetic conditions that um, it has um, accelerated in, in the last 10 years. So 10 years ago, when um, my son was diagnosed, um, it was a difficult journey to get genetic um, testing um, happening and typically 
you know, 10 years and, and earlier, the diagnosis would happen because the child would, as vision loss would get to a point where it was noticeable and they might um, start tripping over their pet or they might um, have an inability to see in the dark um, and, and, and be able to um, voice that to their families. Um, so it was more a clinical diagnosis as opposed to um, a genetic diagnosis. So now we've got improved accessibility to that genetic testing um, and we've had children as young as um, four or six months old being um, confirmed um, with Usher syndrome, which um, is an amazing thing to happen um, purely because it, it, when Emily and I went through our um, uh, um, understanding of what our children had, we were we were sitting through two diagnoses. So we, we gave birth um, to children that were being um, diagnosed with a hearing, a profound hearing loss, and then dealing with a with a with a deaf child with a who was aided with cochlear implants, and and managing that as a family, you know, you think very well, and then suddenly you're hit with a second diagnosis, which is in a way even worse because you're then told that your child is going to lose their sight later on in life. Um, so that dual sensory loss um, is a really big burden for parents. So um, the closer that diagnosis can happen um, to each other, um, the, the better outcomes for, for the families and the parents. There are lots of positives around um, early genetic testing, and we can have those discussions as well if, um, if that comes up. Um, but also in, in terms of the diagnosis, the opportunity for intervention um, and capacity building really increases with that earlier diagnosis. And now we have the NDIS, which, um, you know, for all its faults, is providing um, a lot of support to many parents. Um, I've touched on the two diagnoses, um, and I think, um, you know, supporting that in families is really, really important. Um, we're also looking at um, trying to get some more intervention for the, the vestibular issue, which is very um, uh, under, under, under understood. It's like um, there's not a lot of specialists, if any, in Australia that are able to um, assist our families in that area. And in those early toddler years, when you're when you're trying to um, hit those gross motor skill milestones, it's a it's a really intense period for families. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of issues around comorbidities and um, and safety because. Um, the first thing that deteriorates in their vision loss is their night vision. Um, and, um, and also with type one, they have the balance issues, which can cause um, safety. And uh, the, the, uh, the teacher who um, looked after Harry in his primary school years will always laugh about the fact that I told her that she, my, my son needed a, a teacher in the playground standing underneath him in the um, going on the playground equipment because there was no way he was going to be able to safely navigate playground equipment equipment in school, um, but of course he could um, with help. So one of the things that we have um, uh, worked on really um, hard at you know we've, we focused on a lot at Usher Syndrome uh, at, sorry at Usher Kids Australia is measuring the impact. Um, through research. We were very aware, Emily and I, that uh, we were supporting these families through our own experience. And there is a, that is obviously a very positive thing to be able to do. But uh, we felt that to make much more of an impact, we needed to, to measure um, what the, um, the gaps were that the parents um, were um, uh, the gaps that those parents had and um, wanting to put that into a research document so that we could really justify everything that we were doing um, as a service um, to our families. When, when you're in a support group, um, you, when, you, when you start off, and I, I didn't really touch on this, but you, you run on the smell of an oily rag um, and you spend a lot of time chasing funding. Some of that funding can be um, philanthropic and come from families, but um, 
that is not an easy ask um, when the families are going through enough themselves. And so you're chasing grants. And in order to chase grants effectively, you need really good data to prove um, that the work that you're doing will um, create certain outcomes. And for us, we um, felt that um, qualitative research and natural history studies um, understanding the psychosocial impacts of this condition on families and individuals was fundamental to being able to, um, to be a sustainable support group. So we've had two um, research projects um, and I will do a massive call out to Emily Shepherd here who has, as well as been running the organisation with me, um, has done an undergraduate and a postgraduate um, and just completed her master's in public health. Um, so she has been really um, pushing the research side um, for our organisation. So we've had two um, uh, research papers um, imminently to be published. Um, so exploring the needs of parents of young children with Usher syndrome. And then the second one was an awareness of Usher syndrome and the need for multidisciplinary care, which was um, a study of cross-occupational um, allied health clinicians in their understanding of Usher syndrome. So um, we also would like to thank the uh, Melbourne University Disability Institute um, and Professor Karen Galvin and Professor Lauren Ayton and Flora Hare, who um, all um, pro bono gave their time to create these documents with us. Um, and we're really, really pleased with that, with the outcomes and um, what we can do with them. So that's me as the mum um, of, of uh, a child with a rare condition and a co-founder of a support group. But um, that led me to um, be able to apply for a job at the Genetic Support Network of Victoria. I think um, you have to give up a lot of your time as a parent of a child with a, with a rare genetic condition um, and forego a lot of your career and, um, I guess, the silver lining for me was that I was um, not, I was able to move into this area um, as my career um, when my son was able to, um, you know, be more independent and I could I could step away from him a little bit more. Um, and uh, I was offered a job at the Genetic Support Network of Victoria. Um, so this is a not-for-profit um, organisation as well. It's funded by the... Um, Department of Health of Victoria, and um, it drives um, support, it drives support for individuals and families impacted by genetic conditions. And it was actually the Genetic Support Network of Victoria that helped Emily and I originally set up Usher Kids. So that is a lot of the work that we do um, in supporting support groups um, and um, representing the consumer voice and advocating where support groups aren't able to do it um, for better lives so um, and equity of access. So there is um, a lot of um, work around that um, and I'm a small part of that. I uh, primarily work um, at the moment on an education project which is um, creating resources for school-aged children from years 5 to year 12 about the social, ethical and legal implications of genomic technologies and and include and um, creating resources that link into the current curriculum and to get them to understand um, about these future um, technologies, which will be very much part of their life, but also to talk about um, diversity and um, inclusion and very much as a parent of a child who doesn't want to tell his peers that he has a rare disease, like having the ability to have those conversations started in the classroom so kids like him don't feel like it's all on them, the burden to, to share that. Um, so I think that's the end of my slides. Um, we're across social media um, on Facebook, Instagram and um, Twitter. Um, on both of um, the networks that I'm part of. And um, I hope that was interesting and I'll stop sharing my slides. So thank you for, you, for listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Carolyn's jumped straight in with her hand, but I also just want to acknowledge um, 
And I'm not actually, Carolyn, although I've met you, I'm not sure which hat you wear, actually. But um, I want to also acknowledge that in addition to Holly, we have other people here who have lived experience of a condition or for caring with people with conditions. Uh, one of those people will be known to many of you, um, and her name is Heather Renton. And Heather popped a comment in the chat um, while Holly's presentation was going on. So, Carolyn, if you don't mind, um, Heather, and if you would like to, um, you're very welcome to take the floor and just expand on that comment a little bit around, um, I guess, because I know that you've, you know, in addition to Holly, you've been massively active in this space, but also in research too. And thinking about, you know, the theme of today, which is around um, lived experience and its role in LC research and how we can do that well and what the barriers might be. Um, if you wanted to expand on your comment at all, you don't have to if you're happy for it just to sit in the chat. Oh, no, I'm happy to talk, you know me, always happy to say something. Yeah. Look, um, Holly and Emily, I'm sure can relate to this as well. So many support groups set up, they're really passionate and they try really hard to support their members, but it comes down to lack of funding and you know, many support groups fold. They might go for a few years and then the person gets exhausted who's leading it. And it's such a shame and it's all well and good to roll out genomics at a very fast pace. And, you know, what happens in 10 years time when we're exoming every kid from birth that happens, who's supporting them? And it's peer support groups. Yet, you know, you can spend hours on a grant as do researchers. Um, I'm not saying we're the only ones who apply for grants. But you get one in 10 and it's so hard and it's not sustainable. So I think from a systemic point of view, we need to try and advocate to change for change and see peer support groups as part of the health system. Would you agree with that, Holly? Yeah, I would. And I think that was my point on the um, on the research. I think um, having empirical research to um, actually document what families are going through and the burden and what um, support groups can do to um, assist that is is fundamental to get to that point where it is included as part of the health system I think we're just a few we're just quite a long way down the path for that to happen and um, um, and and I guess um, from from our point of from our experience with us for at Asha kids having that, um, having that research is really is really helpful in that process. Yeah, but it, sometimes it's hard to get the research, especially if you're a small group just starting up. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think I think um, one of the you know obviously Heather Heather works very closely with with um, Monica Ferry, who heads up the Genetic Support Network of Victoria. And I think you know one of the things that that the um, GSMV does really well is to try and support the support groups and and share resources so that um you know, to try and alleviate some of the burdens that are also on the support group but yeah the funding the funding is a really um hard thing for everybody yeah i was just thinking one in ten sounds pretty great actually <laughs> which is really an indication of the, the funding landscape and i also think here it's probably important to acknowledge um, schemes such as the MRFF or MRFF, depending on how you pronounce it, they're actually really pushing um, patient perspectives, lived experience. They have uh, people with lived experience on grant panels um, and they're actually specific calls that are really emphasising the role of patients. But that that's great, obviously, but that in itself can also bring challenges around the norms of research um partnerships with academics and how we can make those partnerships meaningful and so on and you know just understanding the rules of the game whether they be written or not actually about how we conduct ourselves so we, we can come back to that in a minute but what i'm also going to do um is to invite carolyn to ask her question thank you thank you thank you so much and and thanks holly i mean so such a beautiful presentation of you know your life and your family I always learn so much from families it's the first thing I want to say because I'm a genetic counsellor sorry I should say I'm a genetic counsellor and I always learn from and I've been a genetic counsellor for so many years that I always still learn from the lived experience of the family because we only see the family you know for a snapshot of time in the clinical consultation and we might review them and have ongoing follow-up but we just 
you know, we just don't hear the whole story, you know, from start to finish like that outside of a medical consultation so often. So, so thank you for, for sharing an amazing work that you've done. And so my, my, I guess mine's more of a comment than a question really. And it's coming more from a, a genetic counseling angle, not surprisingly, rather than about sort of, you know, peer support groups, but I was kind of struck by the comment that you made about, you know, there was a time where families were given two diagnoses prior to the advent of, of early genetic testing versus kind of these days where we are giving diagnoses, um, you know, early on as a baby, um, you know, you're giving a genetic diagnosis of Usher right up front quite often. And so I was kind of, you know, reflecting on, on that. And I think, I guess, you know, my, my thought is, you know, I never make assumptions about what's what's right or what's wrong or what's best for an individual family. But I was curious to sort of hear your experience of, and presumably based on hearing other families as well, of, you know, what's better or what's worse and how do you measure that from the point of view of, you know, having two diagnoses, so getting two blows versus getting the one blow, but then at a very young age when you've got a baby, you know, um, a newborn baby often, and, uh, you know, we often talk about this concept in our clinical groups about, you know, how how difficult it can be for families to sort of hear news um, you know, when they've got a newborn baby that have yet to sort of know and, you know, bond with and and all that. So it's really more just to comment and I guess never wanting to make assumptions about what is what is better for one family versus another. So uh yeah, I don't know if that made any sense what I was saying. Yeah. Sorry, Rabbi. I have a lot of I have like I can step through a couple of points, I think there. Um so thank you, Caroline. This is a really great um observation. And I guess um since there's a lot I can say around that. So I, um, there we, with Usher syndrome, it is quite um, unusual, I guess. It's, um, or maybe it isn't unusual. I don't know. I'm just speaking from, from my own experience. But you, um, you're still getting two diagnoses. It's just that they're much mm. closer together. Uh, so there was three years um, between the deafness diagnosis and the Usher diagnosis for me and my family. And... Um, what I think is really important as a genetic counsellor for you to understand and for everyone really to understand is the grieving process does not stop. So every time, especially with a, dege uh, a, de uh, a deteriorating condition, so every time he hits a milestone, I'm thrown right back to that initial um, diagnosis. And um, it's really, really um I don't know, it's just it's just really hard as a parent. Yeah. I'm just saying that from a parent's point of view, it's really hard. So um so the genetic tech, the sort of genomic technologies that are allowing um earlier um diagnosis. So this babies are still being diagnosed in this instance with a hearing loss at birth, but then they're being funneled very, very quickly into um a a unit that or a, 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 a clinic within the hospital that will then find out what the cause of that hearing loss is and so that's when this when the, it could be usher syndrome or it could be a number of other uh, other conditions that cause hearing loss and then they're getting that diagnosis so um and um it would be ideal if it was just one, but I I don't know that that then goes on to the conversations um, on reproductive screening and prenatal. Absolutely, yeah. Which, I'm exactly which I don't know if we want to go down that road today. No, no, it that's wasn't even another conversation. That's fine. I, yeah. I appreciate your, your thoughts and comments, and it wasn't like I was necessarily asking you a question or or wasn't even expecting you to necessarily comment on it. it was more just something I was. Oh, no, no, I think it's really about. important, and I also um, think it's what's really important. Yeah is that the families do only get yeah. um, one shot with a genetic counsellor yeah. pretty much. And um, and then what, and then something that we talk about a lot at Usher Kids Australia is what happens to those, to those, who's looking after those families going through that grieving process? Um, you know, a, a good genetic counsellor will say, go and find your, yourselves a couple's counsellor who, or a family counsellor who can look after you as a family unit to get through this process. 
Um, but I would say that one of the, I think personally, one of the big advantages of the earlier diagnosis is that you have the ability to grieve while your babies are very small and they can't understand your grieving process. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, the kids, and even there are still some kids being diagnosed in their teens now, but what we have to deal with is a family grieving for their teenager who is given this diagnosis and then they're dealing with a teenager who it's hard enough to be a teenager as it is let alone a teenager who's just been told that they're going to lose you know their vision um and and you know when that happens at 15 16 17 18 you can't as a parent grieve openly in front of your or they feel they can't because it's a big burden because they have to support the child whereas this earlier diagnosis at least in a very um in a very simplistic way of understanding it is allowing the families to grieve as a couple around you know young children and hopefully get to a really strong point by the time that, yeah. that child is able to understand what is going on i think it illustrates there's, there's no one story and it's just about providing the appropriate support for the family whatever in whatever shape or form and that's where you come in with your group because it's fabulous to have that resource um, yeah. available so thank you yeah. very much no, thank you for your question. It was great. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, and actually, the things that have just come out in that exchange are two things that um, Holly, Kitty and I had sort of discussed in advance in the planning for today. And I'll just mention one of them now and then throw the other one out as a comment that we can kind of keep into consideration. Um, there's also a few questions lining up in the chat and also um, I think one or two examples may be coming through, which will come to, I think, more towards the end of the discussion. I want to try and keep this at a conceptual level to start with around some of the LC, the challenges in LC research and meeting lived experience needs. Um, the broader point I wanted to make, and I'm going to apologise in advance to the philosophically trained members of our audience today, because I know there are some of you here. I just wanted to highlight a kind of link here around the the kind of what we're observing here, which is a couple of things, I think one is um, the increasing representation of patient lived experience and carer lived experience in uh, genomic research more generally, including research on ethical, legal and social issues, but also some of the gaps and challenges that Holly has identified as part of her everyday life. And this creates a knowledge gap or a, a, a space in where in which knowledge is not present that should be accounted for in, in everything to do with implementation and advancement of genetic and genomic technologies. And in the kind of philosophy and bioethics world, we refer to this as epistemic injustice. And it, it is this the, the sense that an injustice is perpetuated because of a forms of knowledge that are lacking. And so decisions are being made without this form of knowledge. Now, um, epistemic injustice is kind of divided up into two different forms, one of which is knowledge that we simply cannot know, and that's not relevant here. And the other one is called testimonial injustice. And it's this sense that there is testimony or um, kind of knowledge out there, but it is not ending up where it needs to be. And I think this increasing inclusion of lived experience is a really important vehicle for addressing epistemic injustice and addressing addressing testimonial epistemic injustice more specifically. And I think a really particular example of that, which was which Holly has mentioned already and which prompted me to think about this was this uh, process of um, continuous grieving or a throwback to original grieving and um, the fact that that kind of lived experience isn't necessarily accounted for. Um, but there are other kind of forms of knowledges that might not be at the table that we need to know about as well. So I just kind of plant that seed for us all to think about in respect to our own research. And, you know, are we meeting these challenges of ensuring the appropriate knowledge is at the table? And if we are, great. If we're not, then how can we go ahead and do that better? Um, the other thing I think that's really important to mention, um, but I'll come back to it, is um, this sense of capacity of families, not mental capacity, but literally just energy, time, um, kind of making time for this type of contribution on top of everything that is already going on for them. And that can be a really big ask and not everybody may have capacity. It might also be that families have um, a better, better ability to contribute 
in this way to, to um, appeasing epistemic injustice or to partnering with researchers if they've got higher health literacy, if they've got greater economic resources. Um, and sometimes that might mean that we only see certain forms of lived experience rather than all of them. And I think that's a really significant challenge to how we can research well in this space. I'm not going to answer that question yet. Um, I just thought I'd plant that there for us all to think about. Um, what I am going to do is invite Danya to ask a question that she popped in the chat earlier. Thanks, Danya. Thanks, Holly. Um, great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering, you said that you were developing a resources for young people relating to LC in genomics. And I just wondered if you could share a little bit more about how you're developing those and, and how it's going. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so um, it has a kind of working title of genomics in schools, and um, it was uh, the the project was a recipient of an Australian genomics grant um, last July, which will help us to launch these um, standalone resources on their on its own on its own website. Um, the grant has also allowed me to employ two part time educators to support the educational content. Um, so the originally the project was started. Um, actually, I can acknowledge this. I, I saw that Kerry um, Finlay was on today, so she started this project a number of years ago when she was at the GSNB, and I've I've taken it over. And we started with VCE um, components where we looked at a couple of case studies to of, of rare diseases to just explain to um, students who are studying biology for VCE a little bit more about um, the process of the testing technologies. Um, we launched those resources and they were linked in very closely to the study design of um, VCE biology, launched those um, at the end of 2021 and we had um, 350 teachers across Victoria download those resources, which they said equated to 55,000 students. So on the back of that, which is really amazing, um, on the back of that, um, the Department of Education invited us to take part in um, a science challenge program that they're launching this year with Museums Victoria through ScienceWorks. So they were doing that for middle years, which is years five to year nine. So we did three challenges based on genomics um, um, for um, those year levels, and that will come out this year, which is completely separate. But what that allowed us to do was understand that, that we could create resources from as young as year five all the way through to year 12. And the grant has been allowing us to do that um, on a national basis. So we will link into the national curriculum and state-based curriculums where we can. And we're going to use the power of the, of the lived experience voices, which the community that the GSMB supports um, through videos. So I'll give you an example. Um, the year five, six content, we'll be talking about traits, inherited traits versus, um, 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 sorry, inherited traits versus learned traits and explaining to them that very basic understanding, um, but how we are more similar than we are different and introducing the idea that there are um, kids in their cohorts um, and in society who are living with rare conditions because because they have inherited traits from um from their family and makes them slightly different, but really they're just the same as, um, as you and I. And there'll be these video, um, lived experience video content where we're getting actual kids with six different conditions to, um, to share their story within the module. So I think the point of difference will be the fact that it showcases um, um, peers, um, Australian kids um, living with rare diseases that hasn't hasn't been done and then linking into the so, sort of social and ethical aspects um, of, of, of genomics, in a, you know, from a very basic level in, in year five, all the way through to a much more um, solid ethical debate when we get to year 11 and 12. So um, the program hopefully will be ready by the end of this year to launch the next year's um, 2024 academic year, fingers crossed. <laughs> Danya, you have a follow-up question yeah, too. Thanks. Um, I just that sounds amazing. Well done. Congratulations. It's, it's a huge, a huge endeavor. I'm just wondering if there's any way, are you evaluating this in any way so you can yeah. show that it's working? 
So I, I have just, um, I've just invited um, Bronwyn Tyrrell from Australian Genomics and, and also um, Garvin Institute to join our committee. And she is a, is a very um, well-known expert in um, genomic education evaluation, and she will be supporting, help, helpfully supporting me through that to evaluate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Great. I, I'm going to ask a question to Holly, um, which is, and hope this isn't too obtuse, but I, I'm, you know, we're thinking a lot here about the different challenges and the way that they manifest and the way that you've seen them in the work, the groups that you've worked with. And, you know, what we, what we're learning here is um, all of the different realities about what it's like to live with a genetic condition and the diversity. And when it comes to navigating complex questions like questions of ethics and questions around regulation etc um how can learning about this reality help us to do better ELSI research do you have any ideas about that is that too, I, I sort of didn't tell you I was going to ask you that question no, so okay I hope so I will preface it by saying this is obviously my personal opinion not the you know opinion of everybody in, in this space um, so from my personal opinion, I think as a mother of a child who doesn't want to divulge that he has a rare disease coming from that space, I would like to think that um, the ethical and social implications of living with a rare disease mean that um, that they just want to be normal in inverted commas and then this and this applies to other conditions, you know, not just genetic conditions. So um, so I think that if we are able to provide more knowledge and education broadly, so for example, like the project that I'm that I'm working on, so that teachers understand more about rare disease, that we have um, we have examples like one of the examples that we will use in this resource will be SMA, which really you know if you're in a research or a clinical setting is very. Um, well known but not to every the everyday person so if we can sh open um open the doors and shed some light onto some of these conditions um and allow a, a greater understanding and tolerance in society from an earlier age and and then so you're having a bottom-up um approach as well as a top-down approach i think that would i think that would be an amazing outcome and it's obviously baby steps and there's a lot of work to be done across the board and that's just like one aspect um and again my back to my point um from my presentation i i think it's really important as much um pro bono research work that can be done to help these support groups these support groups don't have grants to pay researchers um and or if they have grants you know the money needs to go to other you know, really to other things, but any work that researchers can do out of passion and love and, you know, if they have the capacity to also um, to support that would be amazing. And within that is, you know, how can we how can we upskill some of the the support groups so that they have their own capacity to to do the research, you know, not you know, I'm in a support group with an amazing woman who has, I don't know how she's done it, has managed to get through an undergraduate and a postgraduate degree while running a support group and running a family. And like, I think she's pretty amazing. As you said, the, there isn't that capacity in every family that is dealing with these diagnoses and these, and these conditions. And um, so it is those voices that always get heard and that get, um, done but how can we bring that capacity um into into support groups you know so that mm. it's a bigger voice yeah so I think if I'm, I'm going to say it back so I've I can make sure I've understood I think you've made a substantive point about kind of approach to you know the content of our ideas and then you've also made a pragmatic point about going about it and I think the substantive point is it's around not necessarily othering um, people with conditions. It's about building in um, lived experience to normalise variability in experience. Um, and so it's when we tackle research questions, it's not grouping people necessarily um, and defining um, participants in research by a condition, for example, or respecting that young people living with a condition 
may not want to be front and centre about that condition at a particular point in time. And that could also change with time, I guess, as well. And it could change from wanting to be really front and centre to not or the other way as well. And then I think your substan your more procedural point is around um, empowering and enabling um, people who work in a support group setting to participate in research while also acknowledging that actually keeping their group going, as Heather was mentioning earlier, can it be a substantive challenge in itself. And, you know, we all also, as uh, researchers, you know, we're working in big institutions where our measures of success are dollars through the door and publications out the door, et cetera. And it can actually make the space for making those relationships meaningful quite challenging. And, um, but uh, alongside all of this, you know, there are big movements now happening around co-design and, trying to build in structures to make co-design meaningful as well. So I, I just wanted to sort of acknowledge and amplify what you're saying there. Um, I also think, you know, another question we had prepared was around the norm, and I've mentioned this already, around the norms of academia and the norms of research and the fact that they can be slightly opaque unless you've sort of grown up from inside and you know what the responsibility is here and and i'm really loath to pin more on individual researchers because we're all pretty tired as it is already and under a lot of pressure like everybody um but i also i do think it's a funder responsibility and an institutional responsibility and then they can bring researchers along with that but i think I don't want to individualize that responsibility. I want to make that something that we can all aim for collectively to do high quality work together. Um, I did also see Falak, you had your hand up and you've just popped it down and you also had a question in the chat. So I will, sorry for taking a while to get to you, but I will invite you to speak if you would like to. Uh, thanks Ainsley. I was just going to highlight pretty much what you said about research oh, partnerships sorry. really. And then you, you've <laughs> answered, the um, you know, no, there's no thunder to steal. But yeah, we we feel that um, you know I manage the research partnerships at Rare Voices, and we sort of um, work on red research that's broadly applicable to all rare diseases, and we'll, we'll partner with researchers that are progressing that kind of research. And it's a really challenging space for everybody. Is what we're seeing is that we're all learning um, as we go, and um, it's there's a lot of blurry lines and um, I think what you said about that you know educating the researcher and, and, and empowering the patient group is just absolutely vital and I did want to mention and I'm sure that everybody's all over this but um, recently there was a draft that went around about involving um, consumers in genomics research and I thought that that document as it was huge and, and such a huge and a great body of work, but it just highlights so much of what I, I would love researchers to um, remember. So if you're a researcher and you want to involve patients in genomic research, I highly recommend you go have a look at that. Um, Thank you, Alec. Falak. Sorry. Yeah. Can you no, you go, Holly. Us, yeah, sorry. Can you share with us a link to that paper? I actually, sure, Kerry, I think, I think he's think on the line. Draft. Yeah, yeah it's, it was a draft open for comment. It was a project actually yes. um, through Australian Genomics. And um, there will be lots of people in this call who can just very quickly pull that link up and share it. I know, I think Kerry is yeah, actually I'll on the call that. or at least was, yeah, I and was call. heavily involved. Um, I'll pop the link up for everyone to that resource. Bit of a shameless Thanks, plug. Kerry. That's, yeah. No, it's it a massive awesome, project. Awesome work, yeah. Yeah, huge project. And um, when we send out the recording, we can also include that link in the recording to the meeting as well. Um, I am going to ask Holly another question, which is uh, whether we think, whether you think actually, or we collectively, patient voices in the LC space are, are we doing a good enough job? And it's not to sort of berate us or self-flagellate, but um, you know, are there opportunities for improvement? What would you change if you had a magic wand and you could just kind of tweak things um, at no cost to anyone? What would you do to um, make sure that patient voices have the right have the right representation in in LC research? Um, I think, uh, and again, I think Heather might have some comments on this because we both attended a course um, last year um, that MCRI. Um, 
Murdoch Research Institute um, put on, which was a fifth, which had to take fifty percent researchers and fifty percent um, uh, consumer consumers. Which I hate that voice, consume that word consumers, but you know, patient advocates, um, and um, really just trying to get researchers to understand um, what um, you know, what carers and patients and family members needed. Um, from research, I think that, um, you know, where researchers have these big grants from the, um, from the government that, um, that, it, that before the, before the application of the grant is put in that there's, there is consumer representation, like right from the onset of creation has to be the initial point, as opposed to um, bringing them in once the grant has come in and then you kind of then it becomes quite tokenistic um I I think that you know goes back to my point of like uh, you know upskilling the those who want to be involved it help them to have the capacity to be involved so we get more diversity of voices in 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 research um and I think as the chat has been saying it that's a very difficult area at the moment and when none of us are really getting it quite right and I'm not sure what the answers are happy to hear other perspectives from those out there um it's Heather's got a hand up so we can I can let Heather continue the com would you like to continue the conversation Heather yeah I, I'm happy to I think um what we find as um patient groups researchers already designed the project and then they come to us and say oh can you write a letter of support or you know would you like to be on our working group instead of coming to us right from the start and I think one of the big issues is um, a lot of these big research um, places like MCRI do not have a consumer engagement framework and I know that's going to change but I think we need pots of money allocated to research um, institutes like universities, MCRI, Garvin, where researchers can say, I need some money to engage with the consumer right from the start. We've got lived experience expertise that needs to be valued. We can show that. Let's get them involved or come to our peer support group and say, we want to do some research. How do you think this will go? So I think there needs to be a cultural shift. I think it'll come, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. And I think it's got to start with the institutions and getting consumers in right from the start instead of saying what do you think about our idea or now can you join our working group so anyway, that's what I'll say about that yeah. and, I, and I think I think also Heather from that point of view like the research that we've undertaken at Usher Kids we initiated that we we were we were lucky that the at that the time when we wanted to do this research um, the Melbourne Disability Institute mm. were providing researchers to support any idea that you had. So no one was questioning our ideas. We were just like, this is the research that we want. And, and the researchers were able to help us formulate um, the research around that. And I think that is true co-creation. Um, and that needs to happen, as you said, on a, like a bigger scale. But they've lost the funding for that program. Yes, probably. they have That's lost the funding ridiculous. for that program. Yes so annoying because it was so good for so yeah. many peer support groups yeah mm, such a shame I also just want to give a shout out to Danya who eloquently in the chat pretty much said exactly what Heather has just said which is um, that we need to go further and provide seed funding for project development to allow for true engagement prior to the application process because we you know academics are very familiar with how the grant cycle works and there's this kind of long-standing joke that you uh, each grant is actually, you've already done the research by the time you get the grant and the, the each grant is designed to get the, the pilot data for the next grant. And, you know, there's, there's kind of a lot of ridiculous aspects involved here in, in the game that you have to play. But actually having specific protected funding for co-design, I think is really important. And that's not specific to LC research. I think that's across the board. Um, and But, you know, it would really help with LC research as well, of course. And I think... Um, I think the sorry. other thing, sorry, Ainsley, too, That's right, okay. is um, given given that there are a lot of um, families out there where the, one of the carers has had to give up their, they may have had to give up their career or their job in the in the way that they were doing it prior to having a child with a with a with a rare condition or a disability. To that, they it just makes them feel valued, like you know they the amount of time that's involved in taking part in these even if it's just a survey or or it's a focus group or it's an interview 
you know, some sometimes it's hours of time that you're giving up. Um, and, a, you know, a $50 voucher, you know, that, it's great, but it doesn't when, you know, if, if the researchers are being paid, and, um, then definitely that seed money should be in there as well to value those, um, the time that those people are putting in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that was kind of one of the, the challenges, um, I think, around getting genuine insights from folks with lived experience. So uh, I think there's a couple of things here. One is um, that people just may not have the day-to-day -day capacity or the space in their, in their lives to actually do this. And that there is a concept of research fatigue um, and how we can ameliorate that and address that in a meaningful way. And I mean, also the fact that I think this is a really big challenge around space in the day to day to actually contribute meaningfully. Also, some folks just may not want to. I think we should acknowledge that as well. Um, but also what we can, the, the kind of issue that then ends up is that it can actually lead to um, sort of a not a full representation of lived experience in the body of literature, because if it's the same voices that you're hearing about over and over again, or perhaps the you know, there could be a very dominant voice or there could be a voice from someone who's very highly health literate and you're missing out on other voices such as folks who are from culturally, ethnically, linguistically diverse backgrounds or folks with um, uh, just kind of low resources in general. So maybe they live um, with uh, poor access to economic resources, for example. So um, I think that's one of the big challenges to make sure that Elsie's scholarship is trying to reflect diversity but also itself um, trying to enable participation from from diverse folks to to get that to get a form of knowledge that is actually um, meaningful and uh, drawn from a broad range of lived experience. So that's more of a, um, a comment than a question. But if anyone would like to respond to that, um, very welcome to. I would like to ask something too, Ainsley. Sure, um, Kitty. I think that was a that seemed like a great um, uh, synthesis of what people have been saying, and um, Holly and Heather and maybe others with lived experience or contact with patients. Do you ever see a, a kind of a distrust of institutions, or maybe with medical institutions or with research institutions, maybe due to negative experiences or um, other kinds of barriers. Is, is, is there any common thread there? I think there's sometimes a power imbalance. Do mm. you agree, Holly? I see. Yeah, I don't really know how to answer that, to be honest. I Maybe I'm a bit oblivious to it because I also work in an institution. So I don't, I don't feel like I could fairly answer that question, to be honest. Yeah. But Heather, you can, yeah. Yeah, I do think sometimes there's a power imbalance and, you know, I think sometimes consumers doubt themselves as being, you know, having that expertise and with lived experience is just as valid as having, you know, the scientific knowledge behind you. Um, so I, I think, you know, it, it had to be a cultural shift and I think, you know, we, we're talking about it now and we weren't talking about it five years ago. So yeah. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and maybe being, maybe I guess I would speak as a person who probably holds power. I, you know, I never think of myself as a powerful person, but I probably am. Um, and actually being mindful of that and acknowledging that that there may be those imbalances, whether perceived or actual, um, and actually making plans to tackle that. Um, Balak in the chat has also popped in a link to Health Translation Queensland's resources, which again, we can circulate with the recording of this discussion to folks who weren't listening to it live. And Salak like says that this is an example um, of good involvement um, guidelines. So thank you, Salak, like, for doing that. Um, I'm also- hey, it was, oh, Sorry, Ainsley, sorry. it was more just to highlight that because I was on a call, I think Consumers Health Forum with somebody who presented from Health Translation Queensland and they mentioned that this particular group actually, and she just assumed it was across the board in all institutions, but they have a specific pot of money that is for that pre-planning, you know, before you even start conceptualising your project fully on your own, it's that pre 
planning um, and involving the consumer and the broader community. So they actually have this pot of money available to them, which is quite unique, um, but they had assumed that it was everywhere. I went looking for more and there's, I couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah, look, if anyone finds pots of money that we don't know about, um, I'm sure we'd all love to know. So thank you. That's And also it's kind of interesting, I guess, what perceptions are out there around what's actually available and what isn't so that that can be an interesting knowledge imbalance as well so coming to the table and sharing those knowledges can be really important um we've had a lot of kind of discussion in the round and I thought I might um start to draw things to a close and before we can jump into breakout groups if people would like to say hi to each other in a more informal way um Back at the start, um, one of our participants noted to me in the chat that they had a question that is kind of maybe starting to apply everything that we've been talking about to a more practical example of where an ELSI issue is currently arising. So Matilda, um, Matilda Hayes from Australian Genomics, um, would, you, would you like to ask the question that you popped to me in the chat earlier? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you, Ainsley. And thank you, Holly, for like a really lovely talk. And it was excellent to hear more about Usher Kids and also your lived experience. Um, so the question that I was asking was also related to your discussion about um, how you felt that you had two diagnoses that were quite far apart and that um, I guess receiving those two diagnoses closer together would be preferable. Um, and then I was sort of starting to think about um, newborn screening programs and using genomic um, tools for newborn screening. And I was just wondering how you would feel about, you know, receiving a diagnosis potentially at birth before any symptoms had arisen in the child. Um, okay, so that, thank you, Matilda. It's a very interesting question because I, I jumped on the phone to Emily before this started and I said, what happens if somebody asks me? <laughs> What do you, what should what where do you think we should I should stand on this and uh, look it's a very um, it's a big question because I guess um, um, Usher syndrome is a condition that um, people will live very very good quality lives with um, and so if um, so so you're asking about screening. Um, um, uh, sort of reproductive prenatal screening or just just newborn just one um, newborn so screening. reproductive is an, is another question but yeah. I think my question today was more focused on in that newborn screening sort of period um I think yeah I personally and it's just personally I think one diagnosis would totally be a much better option than than two because mm -hmm. uh, um it just you, as I, I kind of alluded to, we we thought we were doing really well having dealt with one and then we were hit with a second blow. So um, it it's just that continual grieving process um, that you're having to deal with um, and if um, which may which may not go away from having one diagnosis, but at least you're having everything together um, rather than just um, thinking everything's okay, but actually there's more there's more to come. So uh, from a personal point of view, yes, definitely think it would be a better option. Yep. Thank you. I'll just add um, that because you mentioned reproductive genetic carrier screening too, and I've just had a really quick look at the gene list that was used in the pilot that ended last year, the McKenzie's mission pilot, and I'll acknowledge here that I was a member of that research team um, and there will be others on the call, including Lisa Dive, who were part of that team. And Usher syndrome is on the gene list for McKenzie's mission. And for those of you not aware, McKenzie's used a couples-based test, which meant that you wouldn't be told if you were a carrier, but it would only be if both members of the, the reproductive couple, whether they be um, partners in life or a gamete donor and a gestating parent, for example, um, would only be told if they had an increased chance of having a child with Usher syndrome if both parents or both um, genetic parents had the, a relevant variant. Um, and I won't identify this person, but actually a graduate of the Master of Bioethics at University of Sydney has Usher syndrome. And while discussions about that were happening, I did keep thinking of um, that person. But I think I think the challenge here is um, that reproductive carrier screening can be offered 
not just with a view to termination of pregnancy. It can be offered with a view to making decisions in preparation. It can be offered um, in ways to build understanding, but obviously that's that's inherent to quality program design. And that's in ensuring that in conversations around the conditions screened for when a person is informed that they have a, an increased chance of a particular condition is that opportunities to gain knowledge are part and parcel of the post-test counselling process. And then, of course, what happens is that falls to support groups. And so we come back full circle to the question around appropriately funding um, these because, Holly, your testimony there is really valid and I would say it's absolutely vital to any family who is um, given this information. And, you know, we know there's heaps of adults with Usher syndrome as well. And um, I think it's, you know, it's really interesting around um, how that all plays out really and what that means. Um, and there's a couple of things in the chat as well. So I'm just quickly going, sorry, I muted myself too early. Just going to quickly check the chat. Does anyone else have another question um, that they would like to ask before we draw the discussion to a close? Did, did that, Matilda, did that answer your question though uh, enough? Were, were you happy? Yes, it did. And um, I guess I asked the question in the context of the chair of the participant panel of Genomics England discussing around that topic in a, in a seminar that I attended one time. Um, Gillian Hastings, I believe is her name. Mm -hmm. And she had a slightly different view, but, it, you know, it sort of just goes to show that it's um, it's a very individual question and um, so I guess we should hear from as many voices as we can. Mm -hmm. I think that diversity of representation is really key. And then structurally it becomes a question of, of how institutions can enable that participation from diverse groups of people. Because I think you just want to make sure that you're not hearing just one voice or the same voice or the same collection of voices with absolute admiration and respect to the incredibly knowledgeable and hardworking people that have already built so much knowledge in this area. Um, but going forward, I think if we can diversify as well, I think that can only improve things because it can also highlight ethical tensions that we may not have appreciated if we spoke or considered only a narrower range of views. Um, and just apropos the point about um, screening of different kinds, I think Heather's popped a couple of things in the chat around the importance of knowledge and also the fact that it, it can enable early support, um, as, you know, and also, of course, when that support is well funded and protected. Um, so, um, and yeah, people, and Emily has also pointed out, you know, preparation, not necessarily termination. So, um, but, you know, we can divert, divert here into considerations of severity and what we should screen for, but that's topic for another, another day. day. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to draw our formal discussion to a close here and just to thank Holly uh, very much for your time, but also to thank Heather for coming and sharing your testimony as well. It's been really val valuable to have you here too and also everybody else for attending. In our last kind of five minutes, five, five eight minutes, um, I'm going to just throw some uh, breakout rooms open. You're very welcome to stay if you would like to. I'm going to stop the recording here and say goodbye and thank you to our online watchers.